Let's go to John's Gospel, chapter 7. We're actually at a location close in proximity to what are known as the Southern Steps. Uh, we're going to walk through those uh, uh, gates there, and the Southern Steps are going to be right uh, there to the left. And these Southern Steps, as they're called, are believed to be the original steps that Jesus would have used whenever he would enter to the temple. In John's Gospel, chapter 7, I'll read verse 14, and then verses 37 through uh, 39. You can follow along with me. It says, Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. That's where he would have entered the temple courts using these southern steps. It says on verse 37, On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as Scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. The feast that Jesus is referring to is the Feast of Tabernacles. And this happened to be the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was a celebration, a commemoration of God's provision for the Israelites during the Exodus. More specifically, the providing of manna from heaven and water from a, a rock during the wilderness wanderings. It's for this reason that during the Feast of Tabernacles, there was a procession of priests that would draw water from the pool of Siloam, where we just were, and they would take that water and pour it out on the floor of the temple courtyard during each day of the feast. The feast was not just on one day. It was over a period of days. It was on the eighth day, which was the last day, which was the great day of the feast that Jesus is referring to. The priest would return from the pool of Siloam with empty vessels, signifying that when the Israelites entered the Promised Land, water from the rock was no longer needed. God had provided the water as they needed it. He had provided also the manna as they needed it. But once they had entered into the Promised Land, no longer was that provision necessary. The Feast of Tabernacles not only commemorated the past, it anticipated the future. As the priests symbolically poured out their empty vessels on the last day, the high priest, this is interesting, would read from Isaiah 44, 3, which says this, For I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. Can you imagine this? As Jesus stands there on the last day of the feast as a fulfillment of the prophecy of the feast, He's the water of life. All who are thirsty, come unto me, and you will never thirst again. I will give you water, everlasting water, from the fountain of everlasting life. It was a fulfillment of the feast, the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, it's interesting because uh, he had, in fact, become at that point the fulfillment of the feast, but yet it still pointed yet future to a future fulfillment of this seventh feast, this Feast of Tabernacles. Now, I think all of you are aware that this weekend is the Feast of Pentecost. I had a couple people suggest that we couldn't have timed this trip to Israel more perfectly because the rapture is going to be on the Feast of Pentecost. So I, I don't know if you guys knew that or not. Hey, by the way, that was no extra charge. That was part of the... There are those who do believe that the uh, Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, will in fact 
be the fulfillment uh, by way of the rapture. However, I am more of the opinion that it's the Feast of Trumpets. I see the Feast of Weeks as being the fulfillment of the church age. There are, as I'm sure you're aware, seven feasts, seven the number of completion. And the first four were, were fulfilled at the first coming. The Passover was fulfilled at the crucifixion, unleavened bread at the burial, first fruits at the resurrection, and Pentecost, which will be celebrated this weekend, was the fulfillment by the church age, the birth of the church. Now, the next feast, the Feast of Trumpets, is, I believe, the fulfillment found in the rapture of the church. Then the Day of Atonement is the fulfillment, is fulfilled at the second coming. And the Feast of Tabernacles that we read about here will be the fulfillment that will take place at the kingdom age during the millennium that millennial reign for a thousand years. And uh, we're joined by some, uh, give them whispers maybe, I don't know. I want to, um, because we're not gonna be on the Temple Mount, and I, I apologize for that, we did everything we could to try to get as much in as we possibly could, but it's just impossible for us to get on the Temple Mount uh, today and while we're here. So can I have you turn to Revelation chapter 11 real quick? I want to read verses 1 through 3. This is a most amazing prophecy that John was given in the Revelation to write. He says in verse 1 of Revelation 11, I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar with its worshipers but verse 2 listen exclude the outer court do not measure it because it has been given to the gentiles they will trample on the holy city for 42 months and i will appoint my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. This is talking about the first half of the seven-year tribulation. And what John is writing here is that the outer courts of the temple will be under the control of the Gentiles, as even now it is. If you're standing there looking at the Dome of the Rock and you look off to the right if you're facing in this direction, what you have is what's believed to be the original location of the temple. You know what that means? What that means is, is that the third temple during the seven year tribulation can be built at that location without disturbing the Dome of the Rock. And it fulfills this prophecy of the outer courts being under the control of the Gentiles. It's really interesting. Um, there was this discovery by this archaeologist named Dr. Asher Kaufman in a 1983 article of the Biblical Archaeological Review. Dr. Kaufman stated that the true location is 100 meters north. In other words, he determined that the Dome of the Rock would be in the outer courtyard of the temple. Now, in the Six-Day War of 1967, the Israelis recaptured Jerusalem and General Moshe Dayan, in a gesture that he himself never fully explained, John in Revelation explained it, but he let the Arabs retain control of the 35-acre parcel known as the Temple Mount exactly as John was told to write in the Revelation, that the outer courts of the Gen would be in the, under the control of the Gentiles, given to the Gentiles. And I'll tell you, it's really intense when you're standing up there, and oh, how I wish we could have. And again, my apologies that we're unable to. 
But when you're standing up there and you realize that you're standing on the hottest, literally, <laughs> piece of real estate on the planet. And there's just a, a real sense up there because, and this is why, because it's under the control of the Muslims, this is why we can't take our Bibles up there. And this is why you cannot have a teaching up there. Even if we were up there, uh, I would literally have to whisper because they actually send uh, these uh, Muslim guards around to make sure that the Word of God, that the Bible is not being taught on that location. Because why? It's under the control of the Muslims. Not for long. Not for long. The Antichrist will come. He will sign this seven-year peace agreement. And then the halfway point will commit the abomination of desolation in the temple. When he sets himself up in the temple, demanding to be worshipped as God at the 1260 day mark. And this is when the Jews will realize this is not their true Messiah. The one who they were waiting for and had given their allegiance to. And then they will flee, many believe, to the modern day city of uh, Petra in Jordan, where for the last three and a half years of the seven year tribulation, God will protect them and the whole house of Israel will be saved. You know that saying? The purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation. And we're seeing it fulfilled right before our very eyes. One last thought. Did you know, and we're, when we're at the Temple Institute, we're going to see this firsthand. As soon as the Jews get the green light, they can build the temple like that. Some have suggested in as uh, qu as quickly as 90 days, three months, they can have that temple reconstructed. One of the missing articles that was needed is the ashes of the red heifer. And I know a lot of you have been hearing about some of the news now where there is now another red heifer they have just identified. And they're waiting the, the two years to make sure that it is a pure red heifer. And as soon as they have the red heifer, then they're, they're done. They already have the articles. They have the computer technology to identify the Levites. Uh, that's uh, Levite. They're going to identify you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, everything is in place. The articles have been replicated. And everything is just waiting for that green light to go. And I believe, and I know you believe as well, that that time is very soon. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this location here. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you'll minister this to us and enable us by the Holy Spirit to grasp everything. This is so overwhelming and we've been studying these prophecies for so many years and now we are at the very site that all of this will take place when it's fulfilled. Thank you so much, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.